more than 100 books, chapters, and articles, including the Telomerase Revolution, which the Wall Street Journal praised as one of the best science books of the year. He is the author of A Unified Model of Dementia and Age-Related New Degeneration, published in Alzheimer's and Dementia, the Journal of the Alzheimer's Association in January of 2020, which generated more than 600 reprint requests in the first two weeks. So let's, um, so let's welcome Dr. Michael Fassel uh, from the United States talking about curing about dementia. So welcome. Shakran. Afan. Uh, thank you all for having me in this conference. Um, I'm sorry we're not there, all of us, in person. I think we would have been in this city for Dementia 2020. Uh, but let me actually talk to you then about dementia itself and what we can do. And what I'm going to do is emphasize this, which is not simply describing Alzheimer's or other dementias, but actually intervening, that is preventing and curing Alzheimer's disease. As I said before, not simply slowing it, perhaps, but actually turning back the cognitive decline. <clears throat> to do that, I'd like to talk a little bit about the dementias generally. Most of us, when we think of dementias, we think immediately of Alzheimer's, but we also often think of Parkinson's disease or frontotemporal dementia or the vascular dementias. But as this diagram suggests, I think most of us recognize that there's some overlap. For example, Alzheimer's patients generally have cognitive problems or executive function problems, but they often have motor problems as well and some other problems. The same is true of Parkinson's disease. We tend to think of it as a motor problem, but actually a lot of them actually have cognitive problems or executive function problems or memory problems. There's some overlap. The same is true of the vascular dementias. We find that almost all the dementias we looked at uh, have some overlap. And what this suggests to us is that there's a lot more going on at some fundamental level. And this is even more true when we look at some of the other syndromes we're aware of. For example, Lewy body disease or progressive supranuclear palsy, primary progressive aphasia, cortical basal syndrome, or posterior cortical atrophy. They, they all tend to have some degree of overlap. And in fact, a, a leading category of Alzheimer's or of dementias in the past decade or so has been atypical dementias because there are even global conferences on atypical dementias. Because I think a lot of us recognize that although there are these categories like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, many people have sort of atypical presentations that seem to fall between the cracks. And in fact, more and more people have been talking about mixed dementias these days because many of them are mixed, they overlap. And most of us have begun to have a feeling that at some more fundamental level, all of these syndromes share something that's an underlying etiology. And we tend to talk about age-related dementias or age-related neurodegenerative diseases as a broad category. Now, the question is, if there's such an underlying uh, common etiology for all of these, why are they expressed in different ways? And by different ways, I mean the histology, the pathology, and the clinical presentations are often markedly different, even though they have overlaps. And more importantly, from my perspective, the practical question of how come we haven't been able to intervene? I think that the major problem has been that we have what I call the assumption of understanding. Most of us have this feeling that we sort of understand what's going on, for example, in Alzheimer's. It's obviously a, a problem with beta amyloid or tau tangles, but we don't dig further and ask ourselves what's going on at a deeper level. So we tend to have this assumption that all we need to do is collect some of the details, but that we already have a basic understanding. And I think that's wrong. Let me give you an example of this. This is a hill that many of you have heard of, um, and it's a hill in Scotland called Dunsinane Hill. Uh, anybody who has ever read Macbeth and Shakespeare knows that, Shakespeare, that Macbeth was told by the three witches that he would never be conquered unless the hill, the, Dunson, the Burnham Wood came to Dunsinane Hill. And his assumption of understanding, and the audience as well, was that that was not possible. Now, what happened was Malcolm cut down the wood, used it to shield his soldiers, marched on Dunsinane Hill, and killed Macbeth. But the, that assumption of understanding is one that we not only make in literature or as an audience, but we also make it in science. Example, this is a statement from Lord Kelvin in 1895. At that time, he was probably regarded as the world's leading physicist. And he made an assumption of understanding. He knew a great deal about weight, a great deal about air pressure, but next to nothing about aerodynamics. So he said heavier than air flying machines are impossible some eight years before the Wright brothers proved him wrong. Although even then it took about another five years before the world generally and France in particular began to realize this was possible. Again, people had an assumption. Things drop heavier than air, things can't fly, obviously. And that hides a, a, a limited understanding of the complexity involved. Well, 
We did the same thing in the early 1900s with regard to physics. I think all of us are aware of day-to-day -day objects like my mouse, my hands, billiard balls. And when it came to trying to understand atoms and subatomic particles, we tended to take that same assumption of understanding and simply extrapolate it into subatomic particles. So we regarded atoms as little billiard balls and uh, electrons and protons as even smaller billiard balls, which had no bearing on reality. And it wasn't until about 1924 with the first paper published by Bohr and the Schrodinger equation in 26, that we began to get a better grasp on what was actually going on. And it doesn't involve billiard balls. And it's advances like that that let us have conferences like this uh, on Zoom and electronic and cell phones. It's, it's that kind of understanding that allowed us progress. The assumption of understanding was, was reasonable. We all are used to dealing with day-to-day -day objects, but we don't, we apply those inappropriately as we try to understand deeper processes. And we do the same thing in medicine. Uh, I actually was practicing medicine about 1980. And in those days, we felt that ulcers, for example, pyloric ulcers were caused by stress and acid. And it was our assumption of understanding. And it wasn't until 1983 when Robin Warren and Barry Marshall from Australia published this article in the British Medical Journal that suggested that ulcers were actually caused by Helicobacter pylori, the bacteria seen at the right, for which they won a Nobel Prize in 2005. But our understanding of ulcers seemed reasonable at the time. It was an assumption that we understood things and we did not. Well, we do the same thing when we're looking at dimensions. As I say, we tend, to understand, we tend to assume that we understand the basic process, beta amyloid, alpha synuclein, in the case of Parkinson's and so on, our vascular dementias, it's simply a matter of, quote, aging in the vascular system. <clears throat> but we don't go any further. We don't ask ourselves, are our assumptions a little bit too simplistic? <clears throat> this is a quote from a friend of mine. Dr. Leonard Hayflick back in 1961 was the first person to recognize that cells age. <clears throat> and he and I were talking a few months ago. And he gave me this quote, and he's right. I think all of us recognize that when it comes to age-related dementias, the single greatest predictive risk factor is aging itself. That is, you get very few 25-year-olds with Alzheimer's, and you get a great many people in their 80s and 90s with Alzheimer's. And yet, once we admit that, we then ignore it totally. We totally ignore aging, and we focus on superficial factors, the histology, the pathology, the clinical outcome, without asking ourselves, what does aging have to do with any of this? And that's a mistake. <clears throat> About a year and a half ago, as sort of a result of all this, the Alzheimer's Association globally asked me to go to Washington to talk at an animal models conference. And the question had to do with this statement. Everybody, everybody says everything works in mice, nothing works in humans. And in fact, a lot of things don't work in mice too. Specifically, we do Alzheimer's trials and Parkinson's trials, and we do them in mice and other animals, but none of it seems to translate well to human clinical trials. And the question is, why is that? Uh, I made a humorous remark at the time first. I pointed out that every single animal I can think of, mice, rats, cats, dogs, rhesus monkeys, gorillas, and humans, every one of them at one time or another in my research career has actually bitten me. And I don't just mean children, I mean adults too. Um, but on a more serious note, I pointed out a couple of things. One is that we share about 75% of the protein expression genes with mice, but invariably, every single animal model we look at for Alzheimer's disease is based on that other 25% that we don't share. So it's small wonder it doesn't translate well into human clinical trials. The other thing I pointed out was that we have techniques, for example, monoclonal antibodies, anacanumab, solanezumab. We have targets, for example, beta amyloid, tau tangles, alpha synuclein. But what we totally lack is a unified systems model to explain why those things occur. So what I'm really saying is when you compare the presentation of cognitive decline in mice, and they do, or dogs and cats, uh, to humans, what you find is that there are fundamental processes that we share, for example, that other 75% of genes of fundamental cell processes, but we have different genes, different epigenetic backgrounds, and the disease processes are, ex are expressed in different ways. So for example, mice don't have the same physiology for beta amyloid. So when we try to do mouse studies with beta amyloid, they don't translate well. The same thing though is true of humans. What we know is that cell aging is a shared fundamental process in all mammals and more, but we all have slightly different genetic backgrounds and different epigenetic backgrounds, and the outcome is we tend to get different diseases. I'll get a vascular dementia, you'll get uh, Alzheimer's, uh, Shami will get Parkinson's. We all get a slightly different expression because we start from different baselines, even though we share fundamental processes. So the intermediate pathways are different, the clinical expression's different. We all get age-related neurodegenerative diseases, 
from a shared fundamental process, but we express it differently. <clears throat> so what we were looking for, as I said uh, to the Alzheimer's Association, is a unified systems model. And by unified, I mean it has to explain heterogeneity within dimensions. For example, why is it some people get Alzheimer's at age 50 and other people get it at age 90 and other people never get it? Why is it some of them have motor function changes and most of them just have cognitive or executive function changes? Also, heterogeneity between dementias. As I say, why do I get Alzheimer's and you get Parkinson's? Why does someone else get frontotemporal dementia? Why is that? Also, heterogeneity between species. We know that almost every species we looks at, look at show age-related CNS changes. But why is it expressed differently in mice than in humans, than in gorillas, than in rhesus monkeys? Also, multiple upstream mechanisms. Example, we know that if I get head trauma, I'm more likely to get Parkinson's or Alzheimer's. Why? If I have an infection in my nervous system, I'm more likely to get either one of those or other dementias as well. Why? If I have uh, increased high blood pressure or diabetes, I'm more likely to get vascular dementias. Why? Exactly explain these mechanisms. The same is true with multiple downstream markers. We see Alzheimer's patients who have more or less beta amyloid, more or less tau tangles. Why? We have to explain all of that if we have a unified model. But the other thing is we need a systems model. And I think that's more important in some ways. So let me focus on that and give you an analogy. On the left, you're looking at a Rolls-Royce Pearl 15 jet engine. On the right, you're looking at a Trent 900 turbofan and a single turbofan blade. My partner and friend, Peter Rayson, was actually responsible for the oversight of design of much of this. And he said to me one day, what I am looking at is a systems model of aging. And I asked what he meant. And he said, let me give you an example. If that turbofan blade you see in the foreground fails, he does not ask what's wrong with the metallurgy and what's wrong with the design alone. He asks what's wrong with that turbofan blade in the turbofan while it's operating, in the Pearl 15 Rolls-Royce jet engine while it's operating, in an Airbus 380 while it's flying at 35,000 feet, while it's going hundreds of miles an hour between two continents. In short, it's a systems issue. When that fan blade fail, it fails, it doesn't fail just because it's a fan blade. It fails because it's operating at a high temperature at high RPM in use. It's a systems issue. It's a process issue, not simply a component. Well, we do the same thing in medicine. This is a river that I think all of you have heard of. Probably none of you have seen. This is in Congo. This is the Ebola River. Now, most of you at this point are thinking to yourself correctly that that's a list of signs and symptoms of Ebola virus infection. But those signs and symptoms are not Ebola virus infection. They are signs and symptoms of it. They're not the process. The process itself is a complex interaction between a very small virus and a complicated mammal, you and I, with a resulting cascade of pathology that results often in death, a symptom I didn't add there. We need to distinguish the difference between signs and symptoms and the actual disease process. They are not the same. The signs and symptoms are the outcome. They're not the process itself. <clears throat> same thing is true when we look at aging. These are typical macroscopic biomarkers of aging, things we're all aware of. We see them in the mirror, we see them in our friends, our family, people out in the street, but all of these things are not aging. They are outcomes of aging, they're biomarkers, they're components, they're signs and symptoms, however you wanna look at it, but they're not the process of aging itself, they're simply the observable measurements we get as a result. The same is true if we look at microscopic levels. I could list hundreds of these literally, but these are typical ones that many people are well aware of. These are microscopic biomarkers of aging, but they are not aging. Methylation changes, telomere shortening, none of those are aging. They're simply parts of aging. They're components, they're biomarkers, they're things we can measure. They're not the process, and it's the process we need to understand. The same thing is true when we look at the dementias. These are typical findings that we see at the histologic level or the physiologic level in patients with, with dementias. For example, a blood-brain a barrier failure or lymphatic changes, alpha synuclein aggregates, all of these things, very typical. And again, dozens and hundreds more depending on the dementia we look at. These are not dementia. They are biomarkers of particular dementias, but they are not the process itself. And we need to distinguish the difference between biomarkers and the process. It's the process, again, we need to understand. Many people think, well, that it's a matter of genetics. And that's in a sense true, but you still miss the point here. The problem is all of these are associated findings in patients with dementias. They are correlates, they are predictive biomarkers. Example, we know that if you have two ApoE4 alleles, you have a much higher risk of having Alzheimer's. If you have two ApoE2 alleles, you probably won't get Alzheimer's. And yet, we see patients with two ApoE2 alleles and two ApoE4 alleles and no Alzheimer's, and we see patients with Alzheimer's and no ApoE4 alleles. They're not the cause. They're part of the complex interaction. 
genetics are not the cause of dementia. They are part of the process, but the process itself, again, is what we need to understand. Generally in science, I think a lot of us have heard this phrase, if you can't measure it, it's not science. And that's true, but again, it misses the point. It is not enough to have measurements without understanding it. In the 15th century, the Vatican astronomers had excellent measures of planetary motion, but they had no idea of orbital mechanics. They really believed that the Earth was the center of the universe, and because that, they made mistakes. It was not the measurements that was a mistake, it was the understanding that was a mistake. We do the same thing in medicine. Furthermore, in medicine, if you can't understand it, then you can't cure it. The only way we can arrange cures and effective interventions for these diseases is to understand the process, not just the measurements. Let me take you back 24 years then. 24 years ago in April this year, I gave the first ever talk at the National Institutes of Health on this topic. I was talking about reversing aging and what is aging. And I made a point then that I will make again now and at the end of this lecture, and that is, I said to them, anybody who left that lecture hall in an hour and thought you could reverse aging was naive. Anyone who left that lecture hall in an hour and thought you could not reverse aging was just as naive. If you were sensible and rational, you would leave that lecture hall in an hour and say, I don't know whether you can or not, show me the data. Can it be done or not? Show me the data. Now, the other point I made was this one. What is aging in this process? Not just waving our hands and, and making references to uh, aging just happens, but what really is going on at the, at the simplest levels. So I'll give you examples. These are different species. Typical human beings last about 75 years for a lifespan. Very typical. That is Coco, the gorilla who spoke Tyne language. Uh, she lived about 40 years. I actually was her babysitter for six hours every week. Um, I am humiliated to admit she had a bigger sign language vocabulary than I did, but it's the way it was, she did. Um, typical domestic animals, dogs and cats, tend to, oh, thank you very much, I like the heart. That was you, Shema? Who added the heart? <laughs> Somebody did. I loved her too. Um, typical domestic animals, though, last about two decades, depending on the particular breed you're looking at. And if you're looking at mice and other rodents, typically about two years, again, depending on the particular breed you're looking at. <clears throat> But although we know that different species have different lifespans, many people still say that aging just happens. And if that's true, then you have to explain why it is that aging just happens at different rates in different species. Or if you say aging is just entropy, then you have to explain why entropy occurs at different rates in different species. Well, many of us would then say it's simply pretty obvious. It's a matter of genetics. Different species have different genetics, which is true in a sense, but you see the same thing even within species. Example. These are 30 progeric children, and I used to gather them together 20 years ago, every year from around the world. And this particular group, I took to the White House, and I took them to places you were not supposed to go in the White House. I took pictures you were not supposed to take in the White House, and we were having a delightful time until Sammy, the little boy in the front row on the left with a red baseball cap, and his friend Ori with a Hawaiian shirt beside him, managed to sit on a pressure sensor in the third step up just inside the north portico door, which leads to the private presidential quarters, at which point Secret Service very politely, but quite firmly, escorted us out the door, and we took the picture. These children die overwhelmingly of age-related disease. Their typical age at death is 12.7 years. They are almost all bald. The ones you see with hair are wearing wigs. Most of them are wearing caps or scarves. They have thin skin. It doesn't heal well. It sloughs easily. They have osteoporosis. They have osteoarthritis. They die overwhelmingly of age-related vascular disease, that is, heart attacks and strokes. For example, there's a child in the back row on the right who had a heart attack at age seven later this same summer while throwing a baseball with his father in the backyard. Why does this happen? We know the gene involved, uh, but knowing the particular gene involved doesn't tell us how that gene functions and doesn't tell us how aging works. Identifying a gene that's correlated with this disease doesn't actually explain the disease itself. We need to go a little further. Furthermore, many of us think aging is not avoidable, is just unavoidable, and that's wrong. Every single one of you are listening to me right now. Every single cell in your body derives from a fertilized ovum that you got most of from your mother. At that point, it was a couple of decades old, and she got it from her mother, likewise, who got it from her mother, likewise. And that line of cells can be traced back 4.5 billion years on this planet. And during the entire 4.5 billion years, that line of cells changed a lot, but it never showed any evidence of aging whatsoever. And yet, most of the cells in your body show age-related changes now by the inflection. Likewise, mitochondria. Your body, you got from your mother, who got it from her mother, who got it from her mother, and that line of eukaryotic cells goes back about 1.7 plus billion years. And during that almost 2 billion years, those mitochondria never aged. 
So why, do, why is it that if I measure mitochondrial function in your body, and I'll show you a little of this later, why is it we see age-related changes in your mitochondria now when they did not occur for almost 2 billion years? <clears throat> this is something that's concerned me for a great long while, which is why I wrote that first book on this topic back 25 years ago, and the first articles ever in the medical literature with JAMA. And what I was saying in those articles was that if we could truly understand the aging process at the cellular and genetic levels, then we could intervene effectively to cure and prevent age-related diseases. And that was followed by the first and still the only textbook in this area from Oxford University Press. I wish you luck. It's a good textbook. It's a hard read. It's got 4,700 references, but I think it explains what's really going on, followed by the book that Shema mentioned already, which got good reviews in the Wall Street Journal. But I went a little bit further than that, too, because what I continue to ask is, what is aging itself? I think all of us recognize that entropy plays some role, that is continual damage occurs in cells and in our bodies. But it's obviously more than that. And it's a balance between entropy and maintenance. So let me give you an example. These are two pictures of my gardens, actually. I like gardening. But a good garden is not a matter of simply planting it and walking away. It demands continual maintenance. A garden does not continue to do well because it has no weeds. It continues to get weeds. It does well because you continue to weed and in general, maintenance. But the same is true of you and I. The reason that a germ cell line, for example, goes back 4.5 billion years without evidence of aging is not because entropy didn't occur. It's because maintenance kept, kept up with it flawlessly for all of that time. That does not occur in many of our somatic cells. So for example, if I look at the fibroblasts, the keratinocytes, and that 80-year-old man's hand feeding the bluebird on the left, entropy has gone on in the same rate it has in the germ cell lines, but maintenance has fallen off. And as a result, you see aging and age-related changes. Let me look at cells for a minute. In young cells, they tend to have long telomeres which modulate gene expression. And there's a very particular pattern of gene expression in any cell of your body. The difference between a young cell and an old cell is not the genes, it's the pattern of gene expression. Example, if I were to measure my cell function at age 10, I would have a distinctive, cell, a distinctive set of gene expressions in every cell in my body. I turned 70 later this year. My gene expression is different. My genes are the same. My telomeres are shorter. My pattern of gene expression has changed. It is not the genes that have changed, it's the pattern of expression. Let me use an analogy for this. If I look at a symphony orchestra and one day it's playing Brahms and the next day it's playing John Cage or Beethoven or even Ragas and Talas, the difference is not the musician and it's not the instrument. It is the score they're playing and it's the tempo and the conductor sends that tempo. Within cells, the same thing is true. The telomere sets the score and sets the tempo. The genes themselves, the instruments, for example, don't change. The difference between a young cell and an old cell is not that in an old cell, the first violinist is deaf or the oboe is dented or the piano is out of tune. It's simply the score they're playing. The same thing is true of our old cells. What's going on is this. In every molecular pool in your body, whatever it is, whether I'm looking at the collagen and the elastin between the skin cells and my chin here, or whether I'm looking at beta amyloid outside of my neurons, or whether I'm looking at, at aerobic enzymes in my mitochondria, they're all being turned over. They are turned over dynamically. And in young cells, anytime you get damaged, signified here by that little red star, it is washed out. So for example, in a ten, as a 10-year-old, I was continually turning over, recycling my collagen and my elastin in my skin and my face. And anytime I had what would have been otherwise wrinkles or damage, they were continually being turned over. But as I get older, this begins to happen. Telomere shorten, begins to change the pattern of gene expression, the rate of gene expression in a sense, and you begin to get this gradual accumulation of damage. And as a result, dysfunctional cells. And in oldest, your oldest cells, this is a real problem. You have dysfunctional cells and sometimes dead cells as a result. The problem is the molecular turnover that slows down. You can even look at this mathematically. This is taken from my textbook. And in simplistic terms, all this says is in young cells, if you have a very rapid rate of recycling or molecular turnover, then at equilibrium, the accrued damage is pretty small. Whereas if you slow down the rate of turnover and have the same rate of damage, then at equilibrium, the accrued damage is pretty big. So old cells accumulate damage, not simply because damage has occurred, but because they're not recycling it as fast. Well, let me look at an example for you. This is an example from Alzheimer's disease. In Alzheimer's disease, we see beta amyloid aggregates, mini aggregates, uh, followed by beta amyloid plaque. And in young cells, it is generally the, the microglia that are producing and then excreting and then 
binding and taking back up and then degrading that beta amyloid. It's continually being recycled. So even though there's damage to the beta amyloid molecules, it doesn't make much difference because it's being turned over so fast. As you get older, however, the rate of turnover goes down. So you begin to get slow accumulation of beta amyloid microaggregates. At this point, you might ask yourself, what does that have to do with your genes? As I say, APOE2 alleles are good, APOE4 alleles are bad. And the rule, rule it plays is this. If I have two APOE2 alleles, which have low risk, I'm making a kind of beta amyloid that's not very sticky. So it doesn't bind together very well. And in short, even though I slow down my rate of turnover of those molecules, most of them don't tend to form aggregates. So I may end up being 100 years old and not have Alzheimer's. But if I have two APOE4 alleles, I make a stickier form of beta amyloid. And the result is, even though I've only slightly slowed, slowed down my rate of turnover, and we've measured those rates of turnover, the result is you begin to get microaggregates. This is exactly why some people with this disease show beta amyloid aggregates and Alzheimer's at age 50. And most of us don't until we're 70 or 80, and some people don't until they're 100. It's only partly the genes. A lot of it has to do with this rate of turnover. But regardless, if it gets bad enough, you begin to go from microaggregates to beta amyloid plaques. That's not the only problem. The same is true whether we're looking at tau tangles, mitochondrial dysfunction, alpha-synuclein, inflammatory changes, or dozens of other changes I could talk about. In every case, we find that this slowing rate of gene expression and recycling of molecules results in pathology. And the outcome of that is loss of synapses, dysfunctional neurons, dead cells, and clinical dementias and the sort of thing we see in patients who no longer can remember things or function well. I mentioned nucleus and the mitochondria as well. If we look at mitochondrial function, you see the same thing going on. 99% of all of the enzymes you make to create energy in your cells come from the nucleus, and all of them are slowed down as you get older. That is, the recycling rate goes down. So anytime there's damage to those enzymes, they don't get recycled fast enough, and the result is they're not very efficient. So not only do you make less energy, which is why at age 90, I don't have much energy, and at age nine, I have a lot, but you also find you make more free radicals as a result of these errors. Not only that, but the membranes of the mitochondria become leakier because the lipids in those membranes are also being turned over more slowly, so they oxidize, so they leak. So you're making more free radicals, you're leaking them out into the cell cytoplasm, and your scavenging molecules, catalase, superoxide, dismutase, are also being turned over more slowly. And the result is you don't capture them. And when you cause damage, the damage isn't being turned over very fast too. So for four separate reasons, your cells become much more inefficient as we get older. I just mentioned the turnover of the cells and almost the turnover of the molecules. Almost all the molecules you make, almost everything in your body gets turned over with one exception. There's one set of molecules you don't turn over, you actually repair. And those are your chromosomes, your genes. Now, every one of you, since you've been sitting here talking to me for about 20 minutes, has had damage in every cell in your body. You've had DNA damage, you've had little mutations, and flawlessly, you have probably repaired every single one of them in literally trillions of your cells. And you've done that with four families of enzymes, detection, excision, replacement, ligation. Every one of those families of enzymes also gets slowed down as your cells get older. And the result of that is not only is detection worse, but it multiplies times the excision slowing down, and that's multiplied times replacement slowing down, which is multiplied times lig ligation slowing down. And the result of that is you get this exponential increase in cancer with age. And it doesn't matter, in a sense, how many years you've lived. The question is what species you are. So, for example, mice have an exponential increase in two years, and you and I have it, for example, in 100 years. <clears throat> genes play a role. If you have bad genes that are bad at DNA repair, you'll have more cancer. <clears throat> but note that what this really says is your lifetime incidence of cancer is not strictly a matter of exposure to carcinogens. It's a matter of repair of damage from exposure to carcinogens. That's why this rate goes up exponentially. It is not simply exposure to carcinogens. That does matter. But it's much more important whether you're able to repair the damage that you have. <clears throat> you might have gotten the idea that I'm implying that telomeres cause aging, and they do not. As I say, they're part, they're key player in the aging process, but they're not cause. <clears throat> to say telomeres cause aging would be like saying genes cause evolution. Genes don't cause evolution, but they are critical to evolution. Telomeres likewise, they are not the cause. To talk about causation in a complex system like this is simplistic. <clears throat> There is no linear causation. Again, it's not like billiard balls. It is tremendously complicated. Uh, the same thing is true of telomere length. Telomere length is irrelevant. It is the change in telomere length that matters. It's not absolute telomere length. It's relative telomere length. 
So for example, you can actually predict lifespan in any species based on the rate of telomere loss. Example, there are mice that have telomeres that are 10 times longer than mine at birth, and yet I have a lifespan 40 times longer than the typical mouse. It is not telomere length that matters. It has no relevance. It is the change in length and the effects on gene expression that I've just talked about that is critical in this. Now, I'm gonna look like I'm getting more complex, but I'm not. This is actually taken from my recent paper. And all this says is that upstream, there are a lot of things that affect cell aging, and downstream, there are a lot of outcomes from it. Example, we know that if you're exposed to certain herbicides, toxins, you have an increased risk of Parkinson's disease. And that works by actually changing, by getting rid of cells, you get a cell division, shorter telomeres, alter gene expression, cell dysfunction, and the outcome is, for example, Parkinson's. But the same thing is true of other things, trauma, for example. We know head trauma increases your risk of Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. For, exact, for that matter, trauma to your knee increases your risk of osteoporosis and osteoarthritis in your knee. <clears throat> Likewise, exposure to radiation, infections, all of these things, or hyperglycemia and hypertension increase your risk for vascular dementia. But they all work through cellular aging, and the outcomes are multiple. Now, let me say something odd. None of this matters. I, in some sense, don't really care what causes aging. My question is a much more practical one, which is I'd like to know where is the single most effective point of intervention, both clinically and financially? In short, how can we make people's lives better? The rest of it to me is philosophy. And the answer is not the upstream and downstream targets. <clears throat> Example, if I prevent you from having any trauma to the head, you still have a risk of Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. If I make sure you don't get exposed to herbicides, you can still get Parkinson's. If I make sure that I absolutely normalize your blood pressure and blood glucose, you can still have vascular dementia. In short, those are worthwhile targets medically, but they're not very efficient targets. Likewise downstream. Currently, there have been more than 1,100 interventional trials for Alzheimer's looking at beta amyloid tau tangles mitochondrial function, and not a single one has ever demonstrated a change in the course of those diseases. So it's not that those are bad targets, but they're not very efficient targets. In fact, the most efficient target that we have ever been able, ever been able to find is cell aging itself. And the reason I say that is because it works. We have shown now 22 years ago that we can actually reverse aging human cells in the laboratory. We, 20 years ago, showed that we, could reverse cell, we can reverse aging in human tissues in the laboratory. And as of nine years ago, we showed that we can at least partially reverse aging in mice in, in whole mice in the laboratory. Um, so we have good solid data for this, good proof of concept. In fact, if we look at the careful studies done at Harvard and at Maria Blasco's lab in Madrid, we see that we can actually reverse cell senescence in the central nervous system, restore neural function, and actually reverse cognitive decline in these animals. They actually get better in terms of their cognitive function and their behavioral function. <clears throat> Well, as a result, after that Alzheimer, Alzheimer's talk I gave for the Alzheimer's Association, I was asked to write this paper, which came out in January. And as, as Shema said, it generated more than 600 reprint requests uh, and two dozen requests to give talks like this one and a lot of interest from investors. But that's not the important issue. The important issue is that it offers us a, a consistent explanation for all of the clinical and research data we've got. And more importantly than that, it offers an innovative, feasible, and entirely effective way of intervening in the dementias, the age-related dementias, which is why we're going to take this to human trials. As I said midway through this lecture, <clears throat> logic is good. It's good that I've got logic, but data always trumps logic. The question is, what do the data show when we take this to human trials? So in the next two years, we're going to take this to FDA human trials. It's a single-dose gene therapy. You just get one shot. <clears throat> it's an adeno-associated virus currently. We'll be using AAV9, but we'll probably come up with a better vector. We're using a normal human telomerase gene, and we're targeting glial cells and neurons. We've talked to the FDA, and we'll be moving ahead as soon as we can. So thank you for listening, and let's hope we can actually pull this off, which I think we can. Thank you, Shema. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Michael, for the presentation.